This is Central Texas Living with Ann Harder. Hello, everybody. Ann Harder here. True crime. It's a very popular topic for podcasts. And we're going to do our first one here on Central Texas Living, the podcast, with the help of a CNN producer, no less. Her name is Stacy Newman. Welcome. Hello, Anne. It's <laughs> great to be here. <laughs> well, and to see you again, because we visited yesterday with you asking me the questions. So I said, today is turnabout fair play for, uh, for Stacy. Why are you in Central Texas? Well, we came here following a case that's you know, a little bit old, but landed on our radar. We're doing a series of unsolved crimes, missing murders, and, you know, and the bucket of stories that we've collected that we've been doing season after season, we ran across the Gentry case. And we were like, ooh, this has all the makings for a case we want to follow. And, you know, we were like, we need to be here on the ground to do it. That's why we're here. You and your videographer um, are here. And you're, how many people are you interviewing for this? And this is the Darling Gentry case out of Robinson. A lot of people go, oh, yeah, I remember that. This was back from 2005. Yeah, well, we've talked to several people, um, yourself included in this. And we continue to build up principles we want to have in this because, you know, what happens a lot with these cases that sometimes I think people don't realize because they always want to know what goes on behind the scenes is it depends on the people involved, you know, and if it's been a longer case, sometimes people decide they really don't want to talk about it anymore. And then you have people that are really engaged and want to continue to tell that story. So, you know, we're in the very early stages of it, but, you know, we've been speaking to law enforcement, prosecutors. Um, we have spoken to family members. So we're just continuing to build that. And this should air when? We don't have a specific air date yet, because mm -hmm. like I said, we're still in the early production stages for this. And what we tend to do, as you can see from Netflix and all these other streamers, it can take years for their stories to actually come out on the platforms or come to air. So we're looking, you know, anywhere from seven to 12 months from now, we'll be airing it. But you know, I definitely will be sure to let you know. Please, yeah. <laughs> yes, because we would love to, um, you know, have you back in some form doing promotions for oh, it. Oh, no, no question about that. And uh, yes, a lot of folks, I posted some pictures of us doing the interview. We went back to uh, 25 News, my old stomping grounds. <laughs> As I said, it was fun being back in the studio. Um, I was a little surprised because, you know, the way local news does, you just kind of roll up, you've got the guy with the camera, you do the interview. I got there at about 2.15, thinking I'd be 15 minutes early. You guys had been there since one o'clock setting up. And I walked in the studio and there were cameras, there were lights. You had, I thought, oh my goodness, network is a whole nother, <laughs> a whole nother breed of cat. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Especially with long format, you know, and you know this from the news mis business and being a veteran so long, you know, there are stories where you have breaking news. You just roll up, get your camera right, and just start right. shooting and trying to talk to people and mm -hmm. so forth. But with this, it's a very detailed production. So we have multiple cameras, we have multiple lights, we have a lot of equipment. So, you know, a lot of people have the look on their face that you did when you walked in <laughs> as somebody who's been doing this business, been in this business for so long, you were like, oh, wow. And then the nerves go up like, what is going on here? But yeah, it's very, very detailed. Well, let's talk about then the story. Um, I got contacted maybe last week, not that long ago, that you were looking for someone who was working on the air in 2005 when this happened, and, and I was. And uh, I said, sure, I'll, I'll help you guys any way I can. And so then I started, you know, calling some friends in Robinson and, call, you know, and, and rereading the issues of the case because, frankly, I've slept <laughs> since 2005. And I've forgotten a few things, but you know, then it all started. Oh, coming back, coming back. Um, this was this was a kind of a stunning murder because of the people involved and where it was. Because Robinson is such a, a quiet, you know. Really, over the years, there have not been that many really major violent crimes take place there. So, you know, just from our newsroom standpoint, it's like, oh, this is in Robinson, you know. Yeah, and I think um, for us, you know, you hear so much about Waco, you know, being in 
New York or bigger cities that we're in. And you're like, Waco this, Waco that is known for Branch Davidians. It's known, you know, all right. of those kind of cases. So when I realized, oh, this is actually a community that's bottled up right against Waco, mm -hmm. it gives you that feeling of more of a small town, local feel where people will really know each other and know this case. And what I tell people a lot as a producer is, you know, you always think these things are always happening in major cities. And a lot of times what we find is, no, in the suburbs and smaller towns, these things do happen. And in this one, as you said, it fits the bill of shock for this to be a husband and a wife. Yes. And and the uh, person who is now in prison for this crime does not fit the profile of a cold-blooded killer. And that was Darlene Doskasil Gentry, who was a cute blonde, just looks like the typical Texas girl with blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful smile, and a mother of three little boys. It's just unthinkable that she could put a bullet in her husband's head as he's sleeping in the bed and then try to, you know, create some sort of crime around it. Yeah, unsuccessfully, and, unsuccessfully. And, you know, you had talked about this before, which I thought was really great of going inside of this. She doesn't fit the profile of a killer. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. You know, why would someone do this beautiful, young, whole life in front of her, three beautiful boys? And yet we find a lot of times, right, the killer ends up sometimes being the killer next door. Right. And, and of course, you know, when she calls 911 uh, the morning of November 9th, I think it was, 2005. Yes. She, just from her call to the 911 dispatcher, created a suspicion that, it, <laughs> that she was behind this. Because it was not, you would not expect for a, a wife to call 911 and talk for 25 seconds about setting up that, oh, I slept in the boys' room, and oh, there was, oh, and the back door is open, and the guns are gone, and oh, my husband's in the bed gurgling, making this noise, and pink foam coming out of his mouth. That's, that's just not normal. No, and what's also interesting, Anne, is, you know, we've heard so many 911 calls doing these type of cases, and you, you know, listen, people react differently to different situations, you know, so I understand that. But you tend to get people that are panicked, screaming, crying. They can't speak. The, the well, dispatcher yeah. has to calm them it's down. Frantic, yeah. Right. And she just was so cool and collected about what was going on. And, oh, by the way, um, my husband's in bed and he's been shot and he's making gurgling sounds. So, And he was still alive. And he was still alive. So that's part of this that, you know, we really want to build around here is – the, the stunning idea that she waited so long to tell 911 her husband had been shot and was fighting for his life. Yeah. Of course, Robinson's small. She's still on the phone, really, with dispatch when they arrive, when the cops get there. Honestly, within minutes. I mean, it's still dark outside because this was at 6.15 in the morning. You see police officers recorded on their dash cam saying, this stinks. There's something about this not right. You know, basically, I think she did it. So immediately she was suspected. Yeah. And, you know, there were a lot of things in that house when those first responders arrived, which will unfold in the tell in this this documentary that I can understand when I see those first responding officers saying uh, something here stinks, you know, because it's like, wow, you didn't even get the full lay of the land yet. You know, you haven't called backup yet. You haven't called oh, crime forensics scene and all that. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that for me made me even more like, wow, this is so interesting because immediately they thought this was suspicious. Yeah, of course, a small town um, was even described to me as being gossipy. Mm. Uh, small can, Texas town. You know, I got to tell you, Anne, from being here, I kind of can see that. You know, <laughs> I kind of can see that, you know. You could say that about West. You could say yeah, that about yeah. Crawford, any, <laughs> any of the local towns. Because, you know, so many people know mm -hmm. other people and they're kind of in each other's business and all that. Kind of, I mean, it's just small Texas town. Um, and you kind of have to wonder, though, how as a couple, because Darlene and Keith Gentry, we're having some problems in their marriage. 
And you just wonder how many people, you know, in general knew that or if they were very, um, you know, just put on a front. And nobody really knew that. I suspect more than one person knew they were not getting along too well. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like obviously, you know, close family knew, friends most likely knew. But as the saying goes, you never know what goes on behind closed doors. And as you said, she just had this profile about her, you know, blonde, beautiful, ambitious. She was a nurse, mother. So you wouldn't really look at that family and also living in an idyllic part of town. Mm Because even in us being on the ground, what I never realized was they were literally across the street from a softball field, a baseball field. Yeah. I mean, come on, talk about, you know, all American. So mm-hmm. that really just, you, you try to get your mind around that, you yeah. know. When well, they lived right next door to Keith's parents, uh, Wyman and uh, Glenda, and just salt to the earth people and folks, you know, everybody in Robinson knew the gentry. So, I mean, they were mm. just very well very well known, respected, and liked. And, you know, this kind of thing happening is just such a shock when something so tragic happens to a family. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, just, again, from a personal standpoint, outside of journalism, you know, I can see that how in a small town, people are like, oh, yeah, I know the gentries. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so-and-so went to school with Keith mm-hmm. or, you know, oh, I, I know this or I, I just saw them or so, yeah, that's going to make it even more personal because if you live in a neighborhood, like I live in Miami right now, if you live somewhere and, and something like this happens, you don't know the people. No. <laughs> but you're still f- scared and you're like, wow, what's going on in this yeah. town? But when it's someone you actually know, like, wow, I just saw them down at the diner yeah, or I just saw them the other day at the PTA and now this absolutely is going to send shockwaves. Well, she did so many things that morning that just like neon lights and arrows pointing at her, even if you tried to not see her as the prime suspect, you couldn't because of so many things that she did. Um, She said it was a break in. Somebody stole the guns from their gun cabinet, glass front gun cabinet, right? Not broken. The key that stayed on the top of the cabinet was used to open, carefully open the front. Guns were out, but then they're stacked up in the front yard. And, you know, when I talked to Lieutenant O'Connor, who, you know, investigated this case, one interesting thing he talked about was the door being open to the house, the back right. door being open to the house. But yet the guns are stacked up in the front, front. of the house, you know? So it's just... That's just a small teaser of the type of things you <laughs> referred to about, like, wow, talk about just errors left and right. <laughs> How not to get away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> Study this case. There you from, go. From the very get-go. Um, and it and it was, it was just horrific, you know, and you think, you know, what if, what if, because when they first started dating, they she wanted to settle down. They met at TSTC. And she wanted to settle down. He didn't. He still liked going out with his friends, partying, Mm -hmm. hunting, doing the stuff that Texas guys like to do. Um, So she goes to Dallas and she's a dental assistant. So she's working up there for about a year. It's like, okay, I guess that that relationship's over. We've broken up. If she hadn't had her car stolen and which kind of scared her, she decided to move back home to Robinson or that area. Mm -hmm. If that hadn't happened, Keith Gentry would be alive today. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of in that vein. You think about some bad relationships in your life that kind of got away from you. And then down the road, you're like, ooh, I dodged I dodged a bullet with that one. No pun intended, right? Like, you you got away from something that wasn't ultimately going to be, be good for you. Good for you. Right. And this was the extreme version of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we will continue with the story with the trial and a really key piece of evidence that sealed her fate. Hey, I'm April. Hey, I'm Caroline, and this is Bloody Happy Hour. Your newest true crime comedy podcast. So grab your favorite drink and join us every week for Thirsty Thursday. We promise to tell you the bloodiest stories and give you a laugh in between. Go find us, follow us, and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. Because guess what? We about to be sipping on some murder. (laughs) 
This is Mandy and the F-Bomb, where we shed light on stories and invite you to find your place and purpose in the world of foster care. Through my involvement with families involved in foster care and being a foster mom myself, I've learned that it's the things that wreck us the most profoundly that can stitch us back together into the best, purpose-filled versions of ourselves. Tune in to Mandy and the F-Bomb. It's stories that invite you in to find your place and purpose in the world of foster care. You can find us anywhere you get podcasts or at roguemedianetwork.com. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. And we're back with our edition of True Crime here in Central Texas with Stacey Newman, who is a CNN producer, lives in Miami. She's in Central Texas with her videographer to... uh, to do some interviews and things for a documentary on the Darlene Gentry murder case from 2005. So it's a while back. Folks are having to kind of rack their their memories about, oh yeah, let's see, how were things back in 05? You know, and you you wanted me to sort of set the stage with Waco and what Robinson was like. And I'm thinking 2005, if you thought of Waco, you thought of Branch Davidians. Absolutely. And so then the the gains come along, Chip and Joanna and... Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I can say as a Wacoan, I am so glad that in the general uh, thought of the public, you know, it's Magnolia yeah, and, yeah. and silos and, yeah. and not, not the, that branch of Indian And I, I had to make my way over there just to peek because, sure. you know, like an outsider coming in, yeah. you're like, oh, Waco, it's this, it's that. And then you see this and you're like, oh, it's really changed. Yeah. yeah. And we, we have a lot to, to thank the Gaineses for where that's concerned. Well, this crime, of course, happening in 05 in Robinson. And, and Robinson, you know, is a very safe community. I just don't remember a lot of major crimes coming out of Robinson. I mean, we'd have the random, you know, drug bust or whatever, a few things, but not murders and not... Um, I don't know, would you call this a crime of passion or somebody that just snapped? I would call it more of a personal crime of passion because Mm -hmm. a lot of times in these kind of cases, especially where it's domestic related, that passion plays out in how the crime is committed. You're sleeping in your bed. It's happening at close range. You know, you're setting up certain kinds of alibis you're it was premeditated. It, right. There was no question about right. that. Right. You're thinking Not it through. Not thought out well, but, but exactly. thought out. Yeah. Exactly. So that's how I would kind of describe it. Yeah. Well, uh, Darlene uh, Gentry had, and of course, she went and visited with Lieutenant Tracy O'Connor mm-hmm. uh, in the Robinson uh, Police Department. And she she never, he say, he's said this on camera, he said she never really asked how he was. He was still alive when they whisked him off to the hospital. Another interesting point that Lieutenant O'Connor brought up as well is she never asked about her kids. Oh. Three children, three young boys. You would be concerned if you're sitting in a police station. Well, they'd gone next door, I'm sure, with grandma and grandpa, you know, so I'm and they spent a lot of time with him anyway. Right. She she kind of palmed them off on them a good bit. That's my understanding. Yeah. But I would say in a situation like this where you're spending hours talking to police and you're you're not there, you kind of want to know, hey, are my kids okay? Can I can I call them? Can I just make sure they're good? And they're in the middle of a horrific situation with their parents. Sure. So you even just want to check on their well being. She didn't bring it up one time. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So so Lieutenant O'Connor stops their interview because they'd gotten he'd gotten a call from the hospital that they'd called Keith as being brain dead and they were going to do organ harvesting and all that and she needed so he put her in the car and took her to the hospital. She gets to the hospital and and she's you know teary eyed and all this sort of thing uh, according to her father in law. But but when they learn learned that he was dead that he was in fact deceased, she, he said her reaction just was it just wasn't what you'd expect. And that's what investigators say as well, that, you know, obviously there's no playbook on grief. There's no playbook on a crisis, but the disparity between how she was responding and how family and close friends were responding was another one of those, "Mm, is there a red flag kind of wave in here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I say, there were a lot of them. And another one that she admitted to uh, police that she's a registered nurse. And did nothing to help 
her husband who was gravely wounded yeah. in the bed. Yeah, and think about your own spouse or your own significant you do so, other. You do so. You get a towel or something even to if stop. You, right, even if you don't know what you're doing, I'm trying to put pressure oh, yeah, on the right. wound. I don't, I, I'm even just I wiping to do the, something. Yeah, I'm even just wiping the sweat <clears throat> off their head yeah, or something. Was, she did nothing as a registered practicing nurse. Yeah, it, there were just so many things, uh, but still, it was it was a circumstantial case. They didn't have anything direct at that point. I think to to pin on her. Um, until later in the month, she decides she wants to just start afresh and move to the country where there was a pond so her boys could fish because Keith loved fishing and she thought that would be so wonderful. So she contacts Robert Pavelka in Axtell. He's a developer there. And, um, and he goes, well, you know, I've got some, some property here. So pick up the story there. Yeah. So, you know, you said it was a month, right? So within a couple of weeks, this tragedy happens in your home and you're thinking about moving yeah. and moving out here to Axel, right? Oh, and by the way, she had been charged with the murder. And she had been charged, yeah. right? They yeah. were suspecting her. So, you know, the friends, he thought this was really suspicious himself. But when she asked, hey... This pond back here, I wanted to get filled in yeah, because just for the boy's safety. Total flip flop from loving, wanting the land because of the pond. Absolutely. To we got to fill this in. Right. And he was like, mm, and he knows, you know, she's suspected in this crime. He ends up calling a buddy who's in law enforcement, and that leads to a web of. Okay. They call in the Rangers. <laughs> we're calling in the Texas Rangers here yeah. and we're going to go out to that pond. Yeah. And within 15 minutes, they find the gun. <gasps> yeah. And dun, they dun, leave dun. A, put yeah. a, put a little stick there where they found it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the thought is, but how do we link her directly to this? And I have to say as well, you know, as you said, it was circumstantial. They finally had a weapon, right? But they took it even a step further. Mm-hmm. And they were like, we need to find a way to actually tie her to this. And comes in the sting. Yep. So what they did, they set up a video camera. And Robert Pavelka, they called him Robbie. You know, his friends that know him. Robbie called, uh, called her and said, well, if, if we're going to push this in, push it in, was a term, we've got to drain it first. Well, that got her attention. Oh, it sure did. Yeah. Because if you drain it, what's going to be left behind, <laughs> We're right? See this shiny twenty-two revolver. Oh there. Yeah. yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So as you were saying, they decide to set up this camera. Yeah. In the bushes to kind of see. Okay, let's just see if she shows up. And the interesting thing is, she didn't show up that night. She didn't. They stay there all night. She didn't show up. She didn't show up cold. You know, it's dark. They're in the woods. Yeah. She didn't show up. So the thinking's like, well, you know. Well, she knows she couldn't find it in the dark. How's she going <laughs> to find it in the dark? No, that's a good point. But, you know, listen, we have flashlights. We have all kinds uh, of things well, to do. And when you're motivated to clear yourself of murder, you will climb through bushes at yeah. night. Well, that's true. You will put waders on and go into a pond. Yeah. You will do whatever you need to do. <laughs> Which is exactly what she did because uh, Robbie then called her the next day and called her a second time and said, uh, the pump will be ready day after tomorrow. So, you know, so that's when she came during daylight hours that next day. And uh, yeah, they were, they were able to video her, but you know, she, she claims, well, I just heard a rumor that, that the gun was there. She also claims that Pavelka had said he'd meet her there. He says he didn't. He said he never set that up, but she was, she was thinking she'd have somebody there with her, but admits even driving over there, I probably shouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. Should listen to that, oh, that yeah. little voice saying this is not a good idea because she goes directly to, in, you know, around the whole perimeter of a pond. There's any number of places she could have gone to start looking for this random gun, right, mm-hmm. that she had heard was there. She goes right to the spot. Right to the spot. And then what you see on the video, which, you know, we will show in this piece, is her poking around she had in a there. stick or something. A stick. The She's, same marker stick they used to mark where the gun... Oh, okay. Right. So, so they, she saw it there and picked it up. And, and started, she picked it up. No, The thought never went through her mind. Why is this stick here? <laughs> She's like, great. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have laughed. No, but it, it is kind of like, you it's know... It's like, a, how dumb can you be? 
It is. It is kind of just like, you know, a little bit of like circusy, right? She yeah. goes out there and she's like, oh, a stick, let me start poking around in this yeah. exact spot. And they were like, Ooh, they're and they're watching her, not just on video. They're watching her in the bushes. Yeah. Well, they they see it all. And that is that is the piece of evidence that sealed the deal. So when she goes to trial in what, oh, nine, eight, oh, eight or oh, nine, eight, oh, eight, wasn't it? Anyway, it was, you know, so it always takes a while to get yeah, a murder I, trial. Yeah, in. I think it, it might have been like two years after yeah, that. It was a, it yeah, was a, it was a good long time. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, they when they showed that video, I heard on good authority from the judge. Who was it? He said you could have heard a pin drop. Mm, I could imagine, courtroom. you know. And I think about even Keith Gentry's family watching right. that video after they were still supporting her. They had been. They had been so supportive of her even after she was charged with their beloved son's murder. They brought her into their home with the boys and helped raise her bond money to get her out of jail after she was charged. I mean, these are people that did not believe she could possibly have done this. And a lot of people still didn't, you know, And but that video, I mean, listen, a picture is worth a thousand words when you see it. Yeah, there's no question. You couldn't overcome that because even Mm -hmm. her defense didn't seem to be able to overcome it. No, and that (laughs) that was the other stunning thing. They offered basically no defense. I mean, they they didn't have any defense witnesses, and they just rested their case. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of like, well, this is what it is. And they convicted her. Took them five hours, which is a long, kind of a long time for it. So it wasn't a quick, oh, yeah, she did it, we'll get her. Mm -hmm. They took their time, but... When they announced the verdict, they they say that she was, or our reporter, Jennifer Kent, who was there, tells us that she showed no emotion. And again, she kind of hadn't throughout yeah. the whole mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She didn't show any emotion. In fact, took her earrings off, and then they took her into custody. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of times with these uh, convicted killers, you know, there is a level to even through the trial, even through the convictions, they're still not, it, the dots don't always connect, right? Like right. what is actually happening? Because I think in some level they start to dissociate that they're actually going to pay for this crime. So there's She a, was kind of counting, I think, on her cute good looks, mm-hmm. the fact that she didn't look like she could do this, mm-hmm. that she could get away with murder because she just didn't fit the profile of what a murderer was. And I think to myself... If there was no pond video, is right. it possible she could have gotten away with it or hung jury? Or, yeah, exactly. Or at least not have been assessed a 60-year prison term. So she must serve 30 years, mm-hmm. which will put her at age 62 mm-hmm. in the year 2037 before she's eligible for parole. The good story out of all this is that uh, Wayman and Glenda took those boys in. Of course, oh, yeah. they love those three boys. They're now... Well, they were 19 months to five years old when this happened. Uh, the youngest is now in high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, the boys are just fine young men. And, and you think that's, that's really such a good thing to hear, considering they grew up right next door to the house where their mother killed their dad. Yeah, and I mean, it, that in and of itself, when you even look at the property, right, yeah. to see how in close proximity yeah. everything is and them growing up right there yeah. and... You know, I I could imagine the emotional tug of that. But from the reporting and talking to various people, it sounds like, you know, they've turned into really three fine young men. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a stunning case. It was something that was just a a shocking thing to uh, happen in Central Texas, certainly to happen in uh, Robinson. But before we get away, a couple of things. I want to hear a little bit more about you. How did you get to work for CNN? Oh, wow. So actually, prior to this, I had worked at Core TV. So I had did been, you? Okay, yes, yeah. I had been connected in kind of legal news and trials and all that type of stuff. So I just translated that over to CNN, HLN. I covered a lot of trials for them, covered a lot of cases for them. That's kind of how the journey started there. Yeah. So what made you interested in that? Kind of, I have to admit, I've covered some court trials. To me, it's kind of like watching paint dry. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, it's, it's my eyes could glaze over if I'm not careful in some cases. And so 
What kind of drew you to that? Had you wanted to study law? Was this kind of an interest? No, no. I always wanted to be in journalism. And you know how they say you kind of fall into things. I think some of it was just working on very significant trials, you know, like a Michael Jackson trial, the Scott Peterson trial. Did you on those? Yes. Oh, my goodness. The Casey Anthony trial. So it's like. Oh, that was huge. It's not just working on everyday cases. Because like you said, those trials could be watching paint dry, (laughs) you know. But these were like. Cases that had very high interest yes. and cases that were covered wall to wall. So it got to the point in my life where everywhere I went, people wanted to know things. Yeah. Like, oh, you worked on the trial. What happened here? What happened there? Do you think this person is going to be convicted? And yeah. So that's kind of how, you know, it took a life of its own. And I was kind of in that crime world. Well, that you have had a remarkable career. Uh, when did you move to CNN? Recently or? Oh, no, I've been at CNN for about 15 years oh, now. Have you really? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's been quite a while. And I even did some politics while I was there yeah, and yeah. news. And so it's kind of run the gamut. But now I'm back to crime and doing the documentary space, which the documentary space is new for me as a okay. producer. You know, cool. I used to do breaking news, mm-hmm. um, day of air, live shows, all that kind of writing, producing, fields producing. So the long format, it's totally a different way of doing journalism. And I really enjoy it. I love the traveling. I love meeting people. Like I love talking to people. And it's also amazing to off camera what happens behind the scenes, what happens, you know, you and I, even yesterday when we did our interview and the cameras went off, you can, (laughs) Basically, to me, you can create a whole documentary of what happens behind the scenes. You no, know? Okay. If people only knew yeah, if they, <laughs> what, what, what went on during the commercial oh, breaks. Oh, yeah. yeah people Some only, of the funny stuff that oh, happens, yeah. and then you're back on the air, and you have to and you have to be like, right. You weren't right. just laughing about something. Yeah, but, yeah, journalism, uh, particularly, you know, news reporting, hard news reporting, you know, you do have to sort of – detach yourself a little oh, bit yeah. particularly when it's local news i've found because often you know it involved some people that i knew yeah that's gotta be of. tough and it is it can't that can be very and, and if you just really think about it you just be a puddle of tears you know and oh, and yeah. so we can be accused of being hard yeah you know but it, there's a little bit of that that a little bit of just i'm reading words on a prompter yeah. you have to detach yourself A little bit. Did you find that? Oh, yeah. It's kind of, I kind of make it synonymous with being a doctor or in the medical field because the heaviness sometimes of the news that we cover, you can take it home if you don't find a way to just shut it down. And also when you're doing it, if you get emotionally pulled into it, it just makes it way too hard to do the job. Mm -hmm. And I've never did local news in my career, but I can imagine it being even harder because like you said, it's like, oh my gosh, I went to school with her. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, I know him from this club or that would be really difficult to do. Yeah, it, it can. It can be can be tricky. Well, it's been a delight talking to you, but I always uh, or I try to end these little visits with a little questionnaire. It's similar to the Ooh. one that uh, the late, great James Lipton would use on Inside the Actors Studio. And so I just had the of, pleasure of meeting him Did once. you really? Okay, yes. so tell me, tell yes. me. Yes, he is exactly like he was yeah. when you watched him on Inside the actor's studio. I saw an interview you did with Sondheim, with Stephen Sondheim. I know so much. Such a brilliant guy. Oh, so brilliant and so kind and so present. That's one of the things I learned about. In an interview, be present. Yes. That, that very very good advice. I'm I'm excited for this question. So this is my little own little take on it. But what is your favorite word? My favorite word, Mm -hmm. love. What about your least favorite word? I uh, can't say it on this podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. My, my Baptist sensibilities. So yes, my mom <laughs> might be listening. <laughs> might be. Okay, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or um, emotionally? Oh, wow, I love that question. Um, turns about new words, learning new words. You're a wordsmith, so that yes, makes sense. Yes, and... I love, love talking to people and getting into the minds of individuals. Love it. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. really turns me on. Okay, then what turns you off creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Greed, selfishness, and anything to do with children crying. Well, you know, and I think the greed, that that just identifies Darlene Gentry. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. That's all money-based. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So sad. What sound do you love the most? Laughter. Okay. Laughter. It's, it's just, con- contagious, oh, isn't it? Oh, it's contagious. And I don't even have to know what the joke is. If I just hear you <laughs> laugh, I'm laughing. <laughs> okay. So what sound do you like the least? Weeping. Oh, gosh. Yeah, weeping. Because my mind immediately goes to tragedy. Yeah. Yeah. What other profession? Would you have wanted to do if you weren't a, a journalist for CNN? I probably would have been a psychologist or a shrink. It could have been, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But then I realized um, just sitting around listening to people's struggles all day, I'm too empathetic. Mm. So I don't know if I'd be able to shut that off the way that I can journalism. Yeah. What profession then do you know you would not want to do? Ooh. Uh, probably a professional I I mean a nanny or a caretaker or yeah I've just those people are so important they are and they have a lot of patience and I don't and also I spoil kids too much so it wouldn't be good to raise Mm -hmm. to raise kids and over spoil them okay and as he always asked what would you want to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates remember he always asked that question well done my child come on in (laughs) Stacy, you are a delight. I am so glad you could create a little time for us. I Thank thought, oh, you. they're going to be so scheduled in town doing their thing. So I'm, I'm just delighted that we had a chance to spend time yesterday with you asking the questions and today with me. <laughs> you did a good job turning the tables and it's been a delight to meet you as well. I feel like on my road to this, I just heard about how legendary you were. So it's been an absolute honor to meet you and thank you for having me. Well, it's been a delight. Central Texas Living is part of the Rogue Media Network family. Be sure to check out their other shows at RogueMediaNetwork.com. Please rate us five stars on iTunes and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Join us again soon for more Central Texas Living, the podcast. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.